Okay, lesson uh, 19. Pranayama. Pranayama contains the word prana, which is vital energy, and the word ayama, which means directing. Pranayama is widely considered to be breathing exercises, breath control. But there are yogis who understand that pranayama is actually energy control. And what I'm going to try to do is point out all those inconsistencies if you approach it as breath control or all this logic that you start to see when you approach it as energy control one of the things of course already clear is how kriya is introduced as a bridge between asana and energy control if you approach Kriya literally in the way it is described, which many yoga schools do, they become, as they call it, purification exercises, physical purification exercises. But the whole logic disappears. The consistency disappears. Everything now becomes compartmentalized and there is no connection anymore between asana, kriya and pranayama. But it was designed like that. The Svatmarama tells us, if you are not ready yet for pranayama, then please here you have the kriya exercises, they will prepare you. And he deliberately, explicitly talks about energy. If you are still in a tamas condition, which means you are not yet full of vital energy, full of prana, you need to work a little more. You need a little more time so that your condition can slowly but certainly change. But why? Why are we facing this problem where most serious yoga practitioners, even people with degrees, present Kriya as physical purification exercises and Pranayama as breathing exercises? Why? That is the Doubting Thomas phenomenon. The Doubting Thomas is a phenomenon described in the Bible. Who is the Doubting Thomas? We think when we read the Bible, only some people, they don't believe in God. Only some people are Doubting Thomases. No, the majority of the people in this world are Doubting Thomases. To understand why, you have to go back to why the concept of the doubting Thomas was invented. A human being, a human being's perception is mainly based on gross perception. What we see, what we hear, what we smell, what we feel, and what we taste. Energy, we don't see, hear, feel, taste, or smell. So most people will never question the existence of energy until they learn yoga in the proper way. They say, what, 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 what can I do with all this? This is all nonsense. I don't feel anything. I don't see, hear anything. It must be something more concrete. And breathing is concrete. Swallowing a piece of cloth 
is concrete. And that is where this wonderful ancient knowledge goes lost. The doubting Thomas in the Bible is about people not feeling energy. Of course, in the Bible they call it spirit. Spirit is energy. Your chakras are energy. A lot of our interactions with people is based on energy. We are just not aware of it. A lot of the information that we get from our interactions with people about those people is not because of what they say or what they do. It's about energy, which you scan with your antenna or your sixth sense. Not one of the five gross senses, your sixth sense. When I was a teenager, I worked I had a, a vacation, a hol summer holiday uh, job at uh, Schiphol Airport, working night shifts at, um, at a cargo, cargo um, um, a company that, uh, that uh, a freight, freight uh, uh, tra transfer, how do you call it, <laughs> whatever, freight company, handling the, the, the air freight. And one of the things that every Friday happened is a truck would come in from the southern province of the Netherlands. Every Friday night, this truck would come and deliver a whole load of isotopes, which are being used for uh, x-rays in hospitals. Isotopes is nu nuclear material. It's, it's atomic. Uh, material that is that is um, how do you call it it's dangerous so you have a whole pallet full of these small boxes which contains a very small dose of isotopes we call it isotopes but it's nuclear material so it's very well packed that's why it's the box is like this but the real content is, is just a, a, a millimeter of material. And from, from Schiphol Airport, they were then distributed throughout the whole northern part, all the hospitals in the northern part of the Netherlands. We were responsible for that. So one day, a, a forklift, a forklift is a small machine, but it's very heavy because it's designed to scoop up cargo and lift it up. So the backside has a huge steel uh, counterweight that, that uh, this, this small thing weighs about four tons, 4,000 kilo, about 8,000 pounds in, uh, in uh, American uh, size. Uh, one day, uh, uh, one of those boxes fell off a pallet and, and a forklift just passing by flattened the package. Now, people who saw it immediately scattered and say, hey, out of the way, we have to inform the authorities. One guy, <laughs> doubting Thomas, he looked at it and said, hey, guys, what the hell are you all doing? I don't see anything, I don't hear anything, there's nothing wrong here. Not understanding the danger of atomic material, nuclear material, is invisible, it's radiation. So of course the fire brigade came in full gear with those moon suits and it appeared that the material was so well packed there was no radiation. So that, that is of course the good part of the story. The thing is, this is where the doubting Thomas comes from. You don't hear it, you don't see it, you don't smell it, you don't taste it. It means there must be nothing wrong here. We have the same issue with pranayama. Keep a long story short, as you have noticed so far, yoga is very systematic in its build-up. 
And in its build-up, there is an incredible logic if you are able to see it. Everything is connected and everything builds on what came before it. There are nine pranayama exercises. Let me see if I remember them. Nadi Shuddhana Pranayama, Surya Vedana, Ujjayi, Shittali, Shitkari, Bhashtrika, Plavini, Pavini is the last one, there are two more, Murcha, and what there I, there's one I'm not recalling. No, that is a Kriya exercise. We finished with that last week. Although people do practice it as a breathing exercise. Uh, Brahmari? Brahmari, yes, the pausing beat, thank you. Brahmari. There is an incredible logic in those exercises, but if you attend a yoga class where they practice pranayama, you never learn all those nine pranayamas. It is usually limited to Nadi Shuddhana, which you very mysteriously have to do like this and then. <laughs> and Kapalabhati or Bhastrika. Bhastrika is like Kapalabhati which you do with your... Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not joking. Breathing exercises are healthy, are good. It increases oxygen in your blood, it's good for your mid, midriff, the, the, the esophagus, what, what do you call it? The diaphragm. The diaphragm and, and the lungs and, uh, you know, um, many benefits. So that, that is not the point. You can do breathing exercises, enjoy them, and benefit from them, and learn real pranayama, and benefit from those. But the question is, why do they not teach nine different pranayamas in all the yoga schools where they teach pranayama as breathing exercises? Why? Because it's impossible to perform them without dying. Why? Pranayama has a structure. There is a, uh, uh, there is an inflow of energy followed by a retention. The retention is four times as long as the inflow. Then there is an outflow of energy followed by another retention. The outflow is twice as long as the inflow. So the next retention is twice as long as the outflow. I will, I will put it in writing so you can see. It's, I make it sound complicated now. So this means if there is an exercise where you have to inhale, if you approach it as a breathing exercise, you have to inhale to a count of 12, which is the basic count, basic, to a count of 12. But you count slowly. You don't count with seconds, but you count OM 1, OM 2, OM 3. So you count slow, like in English you would count 1001, 1002, 1003. The reason for counting slow is to allow it to have an impact. If you rush it, it doesn't work. This is energy. But if you do it as breath control, and you have a basic count of 12, you then have to hold your breath counting to 48. If you train yourself, you could hold your breath counting to 48, even if you do it slowly. But then you have an exhale, which should be twice as long as the inhalation, according to the structure. Then after fully exhaling, you then have to hold your breath again, counting to 48. That is where the trouble starts. That's impossible. Most people can hold their breath after inhaling, 
for a relatively long time, but after exhaling, even with a lot of training, you can never hold your breath very long. Now the basic count is 12, 48, 24, 48. That's basic. It increases by a count of four all the time. So you go to 16, 64, 32, 64. And then you go to 16, uh, uh, 20, 80, 40, 80. And the maximum count is 80, 320, 160, 320, which is a pranayama that takes about 45 minutes to complete. So there you have a huge inconsistency that should, the critical yoga practitioner should start asking why? What is wrong in this picture? What is, what is, what is, what is not correct here? That is why with Nadi Shirana Pranayama you don't hold your breath, you just switch between the left and the right nostril. And with Kapalabhati or with Bhastika you don't hold your breath. Bhastika, by the way, is, is an incredibly extensive pranayama where you have up to four cycles that takes you your complete your whole meditation is covered by your bashtika but it's so powerful next morning you wake up and you, you jump out of bed roaring like a lion so deep is the impact of bashtika so this is what you have inflow 12, retention, forty-eight, outflow, twenty-four, with another retention, forty-eight. Inflow and outflow of what? Shiva and Shakti energy. That is why we had the Kriya exercises. If we had done the Kriya exercises the way they are described symbolically, if we had done that literally, it would not have helped you at all to prepare you for pranayama, for letting Shiva and Shakti in and out of our system. But now that we have done it correctly, the switch from Kriya to Pranayama is very logical. Very easy, in fact. Because with the seven Kriya exercises, we have done Pranayama except this structure. All we now have to do is add this structure. And that is what we will do today. Nadi Shirana Pranayama. No, we will, we will read the sutras and I will, with each of the sutras, I will explain. Because you remember that with the introduction of the Kriyas, Swatmarama built in a booby trap. And he does that with uh, the Pranayama too. For the same concept, he uses three or four different words each time. One time he will say left nostril, right nostril. Then he will say Ida and Pingala. Then he will say the sun and the moon. Then he will say Shiva Shakti. All referring to the same thing. If you don't know what you're looking at, you get busy. And you don't understand what this is about. So it's very easy to grab back to something simple as breathing because that's very concrete everybody can grasp the Hatha Yoga Pradipika many people read that book study that book also many don't <laughs> there are many qualified yoga teachers who never saw a Hatha Yoga Pradipika but it is the Bible of yoga, it's the foundation of yoga. And many people who have read the book 
They don't understand it. They don't even understand the title of the book, Hatta, which if you understand, gives you the essence of what yoga is about. Because Hatta means sun, moon. It is the science of sattva that is described in this book, the balance between sun and moon. Chinese call it yin and yang. Hatha yoga is yoga designed to come to harmony. Every aspect in this book, one way or another, is designed to help you build sattva in life. And it starts from very basic and it builds up to very sophisticated. Chapter one is the introduction of yoga that includes yama, niyama, and asana. But it also has, it starts actually with a history of yoga, which the same structure you find in the Bible, that the earth was created for man in seven days, in six days, and then the seventh day was there to rest. Anyway, we will come to that when we start with chapter one. Chapter two is the introduction of pranayama, but you already noticed Swatmarama is very compassionate. You might find it difficult to grasp the concept of energy control. If that's the case, Sutra 21 introduces Kriya to help you a little bit on your way towards understanding and accepting that indeed energy can be controlled, can be manipulated. Third chapter contains all the mudras. At the end of this course, we will learn one major mudra, Sambhavi mudra. Then I will explain a little bit more about the concept of mudra, because same as with pranayama, it is widely misunderstood. And because it is misunderstood, it has lost its power. Just like real pranayama has lost its power by, by, uh, by, replacing, it, by replacing energy control uh, with, uh, uh, with breath control. So is a, a mudra is a higher form of pranayama. Mudra is a higher form of energy control that has no structure like the counting and the retention, but more powerful than pranayama. But how do we practice mudra? Hand movements. And we think that we become holy sitting like this. So we will come back to that. I will explain towards the end. Chapter four is, of course, about samadhi starting with concentration, meditation, uh, ending with uh, samadhi. So tarana, dhyana, uh, samadhi. The last, the last three of the eight steps of yoga. Very systematic, but if the symbolism is properly understood in a practical sense, actually a very powerful book and you start to understand why Svatmarama on multiple occasions uh, uh, prompt, prompts you almost begs you to keep it secret to not injudiciously reveal to use his words because it empowers people, and people with no good intention should not be empowered. They will end up committing evil. In the handout, everything is covered there that we have talked about before. Um, But also what is covered there is what we will read in the Hatha Yoga Pratipika. 
So I suggest that we start with that now. Chapter 2, Sutra 1. After laying the foundation with the introduction of yoga, history of yoga, yama, niyama, and asana, chapter 2 introduces pranayama. Sutra 1, the yogi, having perfected themselves in asanas, should practice pranayama according to the instructions of your guru. With your senses under control, conforming to a beneficial and moderate diet. You've laid the foundation, you're ready to start practicing pranayama according to the instructions of your guru. You see this every time with a new exercise, which means you need to be initiated properly by somebody who knows how it works. There is a reason why he keeps repeating that same phrase again and again. With your senses under control means free from distractions. You have to focus on what you do. Practice mindfulness. Do not practice yoga with the TV on, playing music, or with people, children running around in the room where you are practicing. Try to find some time for yourself where you can withdraw yourself in silence and completely focus on what it is that you are doing. Why is this especially important with pranayama? Pranayama is energy control through the power of the mind. And the more you are focused on what you do, the more effect you have. If you practice pranayama while listening to music or watching the news or having people around that have their own activities that are not the same as yours, your mind is not that focused and therefore the effect of your activity is not so efficient. That is why uh, senses should be under control and conforming to a beneficial and moderate diet. What is that? Nutritious food. Any kind of nutritious food. In chapter one, there is attention for what you should and what you should not eat. So we will come to that. But in the world that we live in, if you look around in the supermarket, you see that more than half of all the products is processed foods. Processed food contain a lot of not so beneficial uh, ingredients, chemicals, um, ingredients that actually cause the body lots of effort and energy to, to digest. So beneficial food is food that is pure, that, that um, uh, that provides you with lots of energy that you're going to need for all the effort that you, that you put in. Moderate, moderate diet, food, food uh, uh, provides you with nutrients based on which you function. But if you eat more than you need, your digestion will also uh, use larger amounts of energy than it should. And so if you eat a lot, and you, everybody knows when you have a very nice meal and you take a second serving, you collapse. You are, you are exhausted after a, a big meal. And the reason for that is that digestion takes up a lot of energy. But if you eat moderate and light, the process of digestion takes small amounts of energy and it leaves you with large amounts of energy for your yoga. Whatever that is, if that's asana or 
concentration meditation or pranayama. And the more energy, the better, of course, obviously. Sutra 2. When the energy wanders, the mind is unsteady. But when the energy is still, so is the mind still. And the yogin obtains the power of stillness. Therefore, the energy should be restrained. Sutra 2 tells us why we need pranayama, why we need to control energy. When we are restless, it is because, according to Svatmarama, our energy is restless. If the energy is restless, meaning not harmonious, too much shakti, too much shiva, and then the fluctuations between the two conditions, the mind will never be at ease. That is a condition that most people are in. Subconscious chatter going on in the mind all the time, disturbing focus, disturbing concentration, mind control. Why do we need to harmonize the energy, leading to a quieter mind? A quieter mind is much more capable of performing its tasks. The results of your work will improve, increase. The results of any study that you undertake will improve. Your IQ, your intelligence will improve when the mind is quieter. So Svatmarama proposes here to quieten the mind. Start by quieting the energy. You already started doing that, learning about yama, niyama. Because subconsciously, constantly violating those principles leads to a lot of restlessness, internal conflict, of which we are not aware, it's subconscious. Now it has become conscious, and with that we can little by little eliminate it, leading to more and more peace of mind. Then we started standing still in asana. Standing still physically by concentration, the power of the mind. So very systematically, step by step, we increase the, uh, the, the power of bringing all this under control. Energy under control, mind under control. One does not go without the other. When you meditate and you become very focused as a result of your effort to concentrate, meditate, you naturally become harmonious. So it also works the other way around. If the energy is restless, the mind becomes restless. But if you bring the energy under control, the mind becomes controlled. If you are restless and you sit down and you concentrate, meditate, and you start becoming calmer, the energy likewise becomes calmer. So it works both ways. Bring the energy under control, the mind becomes calm. Bring the mind under control, energy becomes calm. The two always work together. Third Sutra. Life is said to exist only so long as there is energy in the body. Its departure is death. So one should restrain the energy. Now this is a sutra, if you take it literally, people assume that if you practice yoga, you can live forever. You will not die. Because if you take this literally, that is what this sutra is saying. As long as there is energy, there is life. If there is no energy, there is death. But that totally ignores the natural process of aging that we just cannot ignore, we cannot deny. There are 
no examples of people getting older, even uh, lifelong yogis, getting, there are no examples of people getting older than 120 maybe in extreme cases. So just realistically, what does this mean? Life here is vitality, not literally physical life. Death here is tamas. Life and death. Life is when you're vibrant, full of health, when your mind and your body and everything is functioning properly at high levels of functioning. With Thomas, there is decline, there is the condensation of energy, and over time, there is declining health as a result of that. People who practice yoga will inevitably remain healthier while aging, but you will not avoid death. That is just, that is not what this means. Death should be translated as tamas, life here is prana, is ki, is chi, is vitality, health. Fourth sutra, when the nadis are full of impurities, the energy does not go into the middle. Shushumna nadi. How can there be unmani avashta? How can there be attainment of the goal? I mentioned Unmani Avashta, remember? Crown Chakra. That is the condition where the Crown Chakra is manifesting its wonderful characteristics. Unmani Avashta. How can the Crown Chakra manifest its wonderful characteristics if all the energy channels are full of impurities? What are impurities? All your distractions form impurities. You will see that the first pranayama exercise that you learn is called nadi shodana, purification of the nadis, which are energy channels. After nadi shodana pranayama, after the purification, cleansing of the, the energy channels, you then learn specific or specialized pranayama exercises. One is designed to take care of infections and diseases, another is designed to take care of Manipura Chakra, another is this. They all have a very particular specialized function. And you will see that based on the logic, they really work. Also, this fourth sutra refers to the phenomenon that when energy becomes relatively sattvic, energy starts to rise up, responsible for opening of the higher chakras through Shushumna Nadi, the third channel. There's Ida, there's Pingala. When those two become relatively harmonious, then Sushumna comes into being and the Kundalini effect occurs with energy rising up, fueling Ashna Chakra and the Crown Chakra. Fifth Sutra, only when all the Nadis, which are full of impurities, become purified, then only does the Yogin become expert in the control of energy. Sixth Sutra, so control of energy should be done daily with the mind in which the Sattvika element prevails. Till the Shushumna Nadi is free from impurities. Impurities, Shushumna Nadi is the third channel. When we talk about purity and impurity, we often think about uh, uh, polluted and not polluted, pl polluted and clean. It's the same with the Kriya exercises. What are the Kriya exercises purifying, actually? 
your senses. They're not purifying your stomach or your intestines with water or your nostril with a cord. That is what we made of it. The purification is subtle. The purification of the senses. The doubting Thomas doesn't perceive energy because the senses are polluted. Purify the, the senses and you'll be able to sense energy. The Sutra tells us that if you practice yoga fairly regularly, you are overhauling your system, your condition. Shushumna Nadi is a phenomenon that does not only occur when you practice yoga, it becomes a new condition. If you practice yoga fairly regularly, Shushumna Nadi is functioning. It becomes a new way of life. That is why I said before to Jasmine, yoga becomes you, you become yoga. It becomes 24 hours a day, seven days a week. A new condition, which is, which you recognize by a different consciousness. You must have noticed from the beginning already a changing consciousness, increasing consciousness of yourself and the world around you. Also increasing, changing condition. You start to feel healthier and happier as a result of yoga practice. Seven, and the last one for now, the yogin, assuming the Padmasana, should draw in the energy through the moon. And having retained it as long as possible, should then release it through the sun. This is your first attempt at pranayama. What are you told to do? This is Sun Moon Yoga. Everything starts making sense. Let's read that sutra again. The yogin assuming the Padmasana should draw in energy through the moon. Drawing in energy through the moon. Chandra Bindu is the moon. The moon gate. Energy that comes in through the moon can only be Shiva energy because Shakti energy goes up, Shiva energy goes down. They cannot reverse. Having retained it, 
you then release it through the sun. Now that you have done Kriya, this is very easy to understand for you, very easy to put into practice. All we have to do now is add the structure. You let in energy through the moon, counting to 12. That is the swallowing of the piece of cloth that you did in Dauti. Then you have a retention. Counting to 48. Then you let energy out through the sun. Counting to 24. Followed by the last retention, counting to 48. This structure comes back in all pranayama exercises, except Plavini, where you have only inflow and retention and finish. If you know this, if you understand this, you know, you immediately feel the inconsistency if you would do this as a breathing exercise. You would immediately feel that is not possible if you do it as a, as a breath control exercise. Also, if you look at the anatomy of yoga, Chandra Bindu is here and Surya Bindu is here, not in the left nostril and the right nostril. Whoever came up with that idea that the moon is the left nostril and the sun is the right nostril, I, you have to have a really strange twist in your brain to come up with such a theory because you just don't understand energy. And yet, the whole world is approaching it in that, in that way. Now the retention requires a little bit of attention. The retention phase contains bandhas. There are three bandhas, we will start with two. Now the bandhas, just like everything else, is surrounded with a lot of mystery, but they are actually very simple. And if you, if you read the text correctly and pay attention to what you are reading, you see that Satmarama tells us that they happen spontaneously. They occur naturally. Why is it surrounded with so much mystery? Some people know the, the bandhas. And there's a lot to do about nothing. You have to do this, and you have to do that, and you must, and so, and so. No. When you meditate, you are straight, and the more intense your meditation becomes, the straighter you become. What happens when you become so straight? Your throat locks. Your chin tucks in, you lock. That is Jalandra Banda. So you, in the beginning, you do it consciously because you have to pay attention, you have to become aware of it. You stretch up the neck and you tuck in the chin. That is Jalandra Banda. Later, you will notice, you don't have to do it deliberately, it's happening already. But it's a subtle phenomenon, just like energy, Shiva, Shakti, is a subtle phenomenon that most people just don't grasp, so we have to do it very deliberately. But no need. Swatmarama confirms it happens naturally, spontaneously. So we will come across that sutra soon as well. So Jalandra Banda is the throat lock. Mulla Banda 
contains the word mula. It's the root lock. You close with Jalandra Banda, although it is the throat, but you close Chandra Bindu. With Mula Banda, you close Surya Bindu. In Ashtanga Yoga, in Ashtanga Yoga, they do this. They squeeze the pelvic bottom muscle repetitively and they say that is Mula Banda. Anybody with Ashtanga Yoga experience? Don't do that. That's gross. Squeezing the muscles is a gross phenomenon. The pandas are subtle. If you are like this, all your muscles are relaxed. When you meditate and you become straight, all your muscles are engaged. Not tensed, engaged. That engagement is subtle, so people do not recognize that as an engagement. So people start squeezing their pelvic bottom muscles while already the pelvic bottom muscles are gently engaged. That is Mula Banda. You tilt the pelvis, you erect, the throat lock is in place, and you're not even aware of it, but the root lock is in place as well. We, this is lesson 19. From the beginning we have meditated, observation, concentration on nada. You notice that you become more and more straight. Those bandhas had already been in place, only I never explained it to you. So don't be too much distracted by those bandhas. Focus on the count instead. Focused count is concentration. So what do you do? Let Shiva energy in, counting to 12. Om 1, Om 2, Om 3, Om 4. So slowly, gradually. You will see soon we will read a sutra where Svatmarama uses the word gradual and gradually three times in one sentence. And it covers the whole essence of yoga. Nothing is achieved if you rush it. But miracles happen if you take your time. Because in the world of energy, transformation takes time. You can try very hard, meditate and, and pranayama and, and what have you, it won't lead to anything. But practice gradually and look back one month from now, look back three months from now, look back one year from now and you will see amazing transformation, you will see amazing changes. So count slowly, gradually, don't rush it. You have 25 minutes, we will increase the total count of the meditation to 25. This process takes you about, with this count, six minutes maybe. So if you take eight or ten, you still have 15 minutes left to concentrate on nada. You have 25 minutes. I think it's obvious that the faster you go through this process, the less effect it will have. The slower and more focused you are on this process, the deeper the impact, the deeper the effect. That's just how it works with energy. So don't rush it, you have 25 minutes. Shiva in, counting to 12, slowly, gradually. Retention, which we call kumbhaka. Kumbhaka is a, a retention of the energy flows. 
Counting to 48 in the same way, slowly, gradually. Om one, Om two, Om three. Followed by outflow of the same energy, Shiva in, Shiva out. But notice that Svatmarama doesn't talk about Shiva or Shakti. Take energy in through the moon, let energy out through the sun. He tries to throw sand into the eyes of people who are not supposed to have access to these techniques. In the next sutra he will use not the words sun and moon, he will switch to the words Ida and Pingala. But it is the same, because we know. But the uninitiated person will only be confused because of that. Shiva in, Kumbhaka. Shiva out counting to 24, Kumbhaka. That's it. The remainder of the time, you focus on Nada. For now, this is it. After the break, you learn a new section of Nadi Shodana that contains two cycles. So we will come to that. Let's just first, like Kriya, this is kind of an introduction, a practice, and then we go to Nadi Shodana Pranayama after the break. Okay? Questions? If you're skeptical, just give it the benefit of the doubt and try it out. You will see. The first thing that you notice is your, your concentration is more focused. Nada becomes more present, which Nada is pure energy, so the more energy you have, the clearer, not the louder, but the clearer Nada becomes. Okay, let's just give it a try. <laughs> 